There's a popular song that boasts, I did it my way. Though it sounds appealing, is this really the best way to live? Hi, I'm Yvonne Pran with Bible 805, where you learn to know, trust, and apply the Bible. We're going to look at around 400 years of history when an entire nation decided to do it their way. In our lesson today on Judges and Ruth, My Way or God's Way, How to Live the Best Way. From our earliest days, we want to do things our way. We don't want anyone else to tell us what to do. Though we may appear to go along with rules as we get older, in our heart of hearts, we often think we know what's best for us. But do we? The book of Judges and Ruth give us interesting pictures from the Old Testament history on what happens to individuals and people when they either do what they want to do, regardless of what God wants, or trust Him no matter how difficult it might be. Judges is a little studied book in its entirety, but as you'll see, it's a very relevant one for our world today and for each of us personally. Now here's some basic facts about Judges and Ruth. Both, most likely, were written by Samuel. The time frame was approximately 380 to 1045 BC. It was around 400 years, more or less, from when Israel conquered the land until they get a king. Many people often skip Judges, or they only read selective stories out of it, and that's understandable, because it's an incredibly depressing book, as the people and their leaders go from being a victorious people of God to a people oppressed by their enemies because of their sins. The Bible summarizes the span of the book in this way, in Judges twenty-one twenty-four, where it says, In those days Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Now here's some tips on reading Judges correctly. Please remember or review or look at for the first time the lesson that I did on how to read the narrative and story parts of the Bible. Each, there are lots of different narratives, I mean, excuse me, lots of different genres in the Bible. Uh, The narrative and story parts, you need to keep certain things in mind when you read them. Keep in mind in this particular genre that not every story, every action recorded in the Bible is something to follow. Judges is an example of how God reports true events, but many of them are not positive ones. We're supposed to understand as we see the people's actions and consequences, how people ought to behave and understanding the consequences when they happen, when people perhaps don't follow the laws, don't follow the rules, etc. We do this because we keep in mind what we've read previously. And in this instant, you need to keep in mind all of the things that God said in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, all the ways that people were supposed to act, so you can see then why the bad things happen to them in Judges when they don't act that way. From their examples, we want to learn from their successes, because they did do some things right, and from their failures and how all of this applies to our lives. Now, be especially careful in reading about quote-unquote heroes in Judges, and as we go through the rest of the Bible. Now, this might be the first time you've read Judges in detail, and when you do, it may be surprising to see a more complete picture of the life of characters such as Gideon and Samson, especially if your only exposure to them was as what was told in children's Bible stories. They did do some great things, but their lives and the lives of many that we read about in the Bible aren't ones to emulate. We're reminded in Judges that the true hero of the book and all the books of the Bible is God, not fallible human beings. God is the one who shows mercy, who uses imperfect people to accomplish his plans, who keeps biblical history moving forward to accomplish his overall plan of redemption of planet Earth and of all of us. Now the book opens, Joshua's died and passed on the leadership to, well, that's the first problem. He didn't. 
In Judges 2, 7, it says, The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Again, it says in Joshua 2, 8, Joshua died. And after that, the whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors. And another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. And my big question is, we're never told why the Joshua and the other elders didn't intentionally train a leader. Why didn't they pass the stuff on? We see the results in the next 400 years from the death of Joshua until Saul becomes king. But why was this? Why, why the horrible things in Judges? We need to really sort of contrast Moses and Joshua. Now, what I'm sharing now, this is simply my opinion, and it's not any categorical truth from the scripture, but I've thought about it quite a lot. Why did one of them pass on strong leadership and the other didn't? Now, here's just some of my comments. Just uh, kind of take them for whatever they're worth, and then I'll give some possible applications from it in a minute. First of all, how they were similar. Both of them were leaders, both legislated, both fought numerous battles. It wasn't just that Joshua had to fight more. Because even though the Israelites didn't go into the land, they still had to fight during those 40 years. They still had all sorts of enemies and things came up. They thought they were avoiding battles, but they weren't. There are many similarities in the demands of their lives. So that wasn't the reason. Now, there was, though, a big difference in one area. Moses preached to the people continuously about how they ought to serve God. Other than battle instructions, Joshua had one final sermon where he says this famous line where um, that's quoted in, on plaques and all that kind of stuff. And Anyway, what he says is, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Well, that's very nice. But basically what he's saying, and forgive any cynicism that may come across on this, is he's basically saying my family will serve God, but whatever the rest of you want to do, that's your problem. And the results were not good. I can't help but wonder if the history of Israel for the next 400 years would have been different if Joshua had cared as much about instilling the commands of God in the people as Moses did. Yes, there were battles to fight, but winning the land, or in our case today, making lots of money or having fun or whatever big overall goal you have means little if hearts aren't also one and dedicated to the Lord. We need to be intentional, consistent, and persistent about living and then passing on biblical truth to coming generations. We need to be more interested in preparing and challenging the next generation than anything else we do for them. They were told this in Deuteronomy 6, as we are, and here's what it says, these are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands. Be careful to obey so that it may go well with you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Serving God in every possible way. As he says, walking along and lying down and getting up in every part of our life. This is to be a pattern in our lives. Talking about the Lord, talking about his word. This personal application is the most important thing that we can pass on. Now, how do we do it? There's a couple of suggestions that I have. The spiritual disciplines, and I've talked about this in some of the lessons 
the idea that we practice God's presence in our lives and in the things that we do are really important. In addition to the Bible, I have two books that I want to rec- uh, recommend to you. I have more about them, or I will have, I'm still got to put it together, on the Bible 805 website, and I'm going to be doing some more on the YouTube channel. But here are the two books that I I strongly recommend. The Practice of the Presence of God. Um, This is by Brother Lawrence, and um, I recommend the translation of it in modern English. This is of a 14th century monk who really tried to focus on God in all of his life. A lot of good stuff there. However, he was a monk. He did live in a monastery. He was very protected. Life was very simple. And the book just focuses on this one thing. But it's a really good, short little book to read. But then, the book I am recommending so very, very, very much to all of you is Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life by Donald S. Whitney. This is one of the best, most useful practical books I have read in a very long time for how to help you grow in your Christian life. It's so important, and I'm going to be doing some excerpts from it on the YouTube channel and various things because it's just, it's absolutely essential. Again, spiritual disciplines for the Christian life. Now remember, no book has the authority and overall truth of the Bible, but these sorts of books can really help us apply it in our everyday lives. So again, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life by Donald S. Whitney. I cannot recommend it enough. Because they didn't do that, here is the overall pattern of judges. The people sin, give in to base impulses, serve other gods, the ones they should have gotten rid of but didn't. Serving other gods results in moral deterioration that you see especially in the later chapters of Judges. God punishes them by allowing the people who should have been conquered, such as the Philistines, to oppress them. The people cry out to God for deliverance. God responds and sends a judge, and they are delivered. But then the cycle repeats itself when they forget God's deliverance and go back to worshiping other gods. Again, you see the judge's action in deliverance, but not, sadly, in continued teaching or in many cases even in moral living. And so because they didn't deal with the core issues, the people, the judges, repeated the same mistakes again and again and again for 400 years. Now, who were these judges? Overall, Warren Wiersbe describes the biblical judge in this way. He says it was a ruler, a military leader, one who decided in judicial matters over limited areas. No income or taxing power, not a hereditary office. They were called and empowered by God. And he says, according uh, regarding the judges, that the monotony of Israel's sins can be contrasted with the creativity of God's methods of deliverance. The judges were really different. No two stories are the same. Twelve is the traditional number of them, but some we don't know very much about, uh, other than their names such as Ehud, Shamgar, Tola, Jair, Eban, Elon, and Abdon. Now let's look at a few of the more complete stories. First, my favorite judge, Deborah, who was uh, talked about, who's talked about in Judges 4 and 5. Israel had been suffering 20 years of oppression, and it opens by telling us that she was already leading Israel and serving as a judge when we start in with her story. She is also the only identified female author of scripture. We find that in Judges 5. God called her to deliver people. She summons Barak to lead the army. He's victorious, though the war ends with the opposing general being killed by another woman, Jael, a Kenite woman. Now the Kenites were relatives of Moses. Once again, after this, the land has rest for 40 years. Now, a few additional comments about Deborah. She was the only judge in the book of Judges. Now, Samuel will be the same thing, but she was the only judge in the book of Judges who is also called a prophet. 
Until Samuel, she's the only one who was actively serving God when she was called to deliver the people. She's the only one who writes a psalm of praise after her victory, which is included in the Bible. And it's interesting that there's no comment that she was unique or unusual, and was an, and this in and of itself is an example that women did lead, prophesy, and hold a position of spiritual authority and power in the Old Testament. Next, we have Gideon in Judges 6 through 9. Now, Israel then oppressed, was oppressed by the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites now were also descendants of Abraham. They were the people Moses fled to when he fled Egypt. But something had gone wrong since then in their relationship with the Jews. Idol worship was rampant and very public. In Gideon's town, there was an altar to Baal. The angel of the Lord appears to him. He's hiding and threshing grain, and he says, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior, mighty man of valor. <laughs> with this verse is just a great reminder that God sees what we can be. We might not feel like much, but God sees us with eyes of love, and he knows how we can be used. Now, Gideon protests. He says, If God's for us, why do we have all these problems? The Lord doesn't answer. He simply calls him to be a deliverer. Then there's a situation with the fleece. Gideon is testing to see if God would make it wet and the ground dry, or dry and the ground wet, and he's wanting to do this to confirm God's calling. It was not a sign of trust, but a sign of his continuing unbelief. Now, God is merciful in his answer, but we're not supposed to do this. It is not an example we should follow. Gideon calls out his army, then the Lord reduces his army from 22,000 to 300 and gives him a great victory. The lesson here, if you don't think you have the resources to do what God wants, that might be precisely the point, precisely where God wants you to be. But after the victory, the people want Gideon to rule over them. He refused, but then he makes a golden epod and the people worship it. Again, physical battle, but no spiritual revival. And so, after 40 years of peace, the people return to sin. His son, Abimelech, kills all his brothers and is a tyrant until he dies. Now, while all this drama is going on, we have a little bit of hope and light, and the story of Ruth is taking place. There's a famine in Israel during the time of the judges, and Elimelech and Naomi go to Moab. Their two sons marry Moabite women. All three men die. Naomi hears that they are better, that things are better back in Israel, and she decides to go home. Both daughters in law start out with her. One turns back, and Ruth remains. Where you go, I'll go, she says. And the most significant part of her declaration is when she says, Your God will be my God. Now they go back to Bethlehem, and it's important to note that this was obviously a city that still revered and lived by God's laws. Now we see this in that they obeyed the laws of gleaning and that of the kinsman redeemer. You see, there's always little pockets of goodness. People who serve God in the midst of evil times. You may feel alone in your work, school, or family situation, but stay strong. God is with you, and there are usually others also serving him that you might not be aware of. But now back to the story. Ruth and Naomi have no money, no income, no protector. So Ruth goes out to glean, which is just really to gather leftover scraps for food in the fields. Ruth just happens to go into Boaz's field. But of course, there's no accidents with God. Boaz, who is actually a descendant of Rahab, notices her and protects her. He is her kinsman redeemer, one who can buy their land, marry Ruth, and have children to carry on the name of the family. He does that. Their son is Obed, the father of Jesse, the father of David. Ruth is blessed, and Naomi ends her life with joy. Now some lessons from Ruth. No matter how bad overall society may be, no matter how difficult personal circumstances may be, God always has people who serve him. And God is at work in their lives and circumstances, perhaps in bigger ways than you can imagine. That's why it's important 
not to focus on things we can't control, but on our God who is in control and who will work out his plan no matter what. Then we come to Samson in Judges 13 and 16. He was called before birth to be a judge. When he was younger, he married a Philistine woman, which was expressly forbidden. That did not go well, and he ends up killing a thousand of them in revenge for them giving his wife away to someone else. He then led Israel as a judge for 20 years, but he never got over his sins with women. He went to Gaza, which is a Philistine city, and visited a prostitute. Sometime later, he fell in love with Delilah, a Philistine. After many deceptions, he finally reveals the secret of his strength, his hair. He had been a Nazarite from birth. His hair is cut, he's weak and captured, and his eyes are put out. But it says the hair on his head began to grow. The Philistines bring him to their temple so they can mock him. He asks a young man with him to put his hands on the pillars of the temple. He does that, and then Samson prays, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more, and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. And the whole temple crashes down. This is a great example of God's second chances. No matter what we do, no matter how badly we mess up, our God is a God of second chances. A really interesting thing following this, archaeologists have uncovered two Philistine temples, and both temples have a very unique design. And please, if you get a chance, go to the video and you can see a little example of this. Both temples have two central pillars that supported the roof. The pillars were made of wood and rested on stone support bases. With the pillars being about six feet apart, a strong man, a very strong man, could dislodge them from their stone bases and bring down the entire structure, which is obviously what Samson did. Now, these are just additional reminders, and I have, again, some more pictures on the video of different things in archaeology that come from about this time that show us that the names, the places, the battles, the timelines in the Bible are verified in secular history, secular archaeology, and this is not a small thing. It does not happen in all religious texts. And please uh, do see the lessons on why we can trust the Bible, and it really, I really go into detail on many of those things on the accuracy of the Bible as compared with other scriptures. Um, also, we have remnants of a Canaanite city, Ras Shamar. And again, if you get a chance, look at the YouTube videos where you can see where it's a really large area. And also, too, they uncovered images of Baal and of the Asherah pillars. Again, many, many things that the Bible talks about, about the Canaanites, about their religion. We have now very valid and complete archaeological support for this. Now, the book ends with really horrid stories. Judges 17 and 18, a Levite man, a Levite serves a man for pay, and then he uses his family idols to do it. A group of Danites comes by, takes the Levite, they go to another city, slaughter everyone. Judges 19 is the story of a Levite and his concubine who's killed brutally. Then a revenge for her death, a tribe is almost destroyed. Because of a foolish vow, they kidnap women to be wives for the warriors. I mean, just horrible stuff. This is not how God's people were supposed to live. It ends with a summary statement that I shared at the start. In those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. The challenge of judges, his way or our way, it's our choice. Judges shows what happens when people do it our way and the results of not passing on how God wants his people to live. We have a choice. No matter what might be happening in our crazy world, individual actions matter. Romans 12, 1 and 2 in the message tells us how to make a positive choice. Listen closely to this. This is a great passage. So here's what I want you to do. 
God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings out the best of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. It will truly make us most happy when we follow what Romans 12 says. St. Augustine summed it up in this way when he said, You've made us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And when we fail in resting in God, in living like he wants us to, we can admit it to him. As Brother Lawrence did when confessing his faults to God, he said, I shall never do otherwise if you leave me to myself. Without God, we're a mess. He knows it and he loves us anyway. Our Lord doesn't leave us to ourselves. He's given us his word, the Holy Spirit, our church and friends to remind us. Make it your goal that each day of our lives and at the end of our lives, let's not say, I did it my way, but I did it God's way. That's all for now. Please check out the notes from this lesson. They're in downloadable PDF format format, and lots of other materials for you at www.bible805.com. Please sign up for the newsletter. I'm going to be doing a whole bunch of additional things shortly, um, blogs, other materials, additional videos. And please tell your friends about the podcast, about the videos, about all of the different things, and encourage them to listen and learn and go to Bible 805 five so that they can know, trust, and apply the Bible. Until next time, I'm Yvonne Pran, your fellow pilgrim, writer, and teacher for Jesus, and I'd like to close with this benediction. May you know the invitation of God to move from confusion to clarity, from wandering to rest, from loneliness to knowing you are loved, from turmoil to peace, from wherever you are in your spiritual journey to a growing knowledge of God's Word and in your personal relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.